If you have a Bible, you can turn to Genesis chapter 50. If you don't have a Bible, there should be Bibles in the chairs in front of you. If you're using one of those, um, you are going to be on page 43 and 44 this morning. This is a sermon about growing old. Anybody feel like they're growing old in the room? I feel like I'm growing old, and I was already informed this morning that I'm not allowed to feel that way. Uh, any, anybody older than you is always telling you you're not allowed to feel old, right? That's just the... Because then they are really old, that, that by implication. Uh, but uh, for the last 15 years, my friends from high school have played a football game on the day after Thanksgiving. And now we are all in our 30s, and we move a little bit slower. And the game went from tackle to flag football about five years ago, and we still wake up on Saturday like, oh, man. I also, I got a little, anybody, if you can see, I got a little black eye, just, you know, caught an elbow. And, and it's, it's a great time, but we always wake up going, I, I, I'm old now. Like, I, I don't recover the same way that I used to. And as poignant of an example as that is for me personally, as literally I feel the pain of my physical body and my aching pride just moving around this morning, I knew, I anticipated that that would not land for everybody, that you all wouldn't believe me, I'm too young to feel old, so I found, I, I decided I'd go and find another example, and I decided to go to the very top of Muhammad Ali. Anybody remember Muhammad Ali? Ali was the self-proclaimed greatest to ever live. He was the greatest boxer that ever was. There are a lot of people who still proclaim that he's the best athlete that has ever been. His first fight was in uh, 1960. He fought for 21 years, his last one being in 81. And in uh, the early 60s, in 64, he won the title from Sonny Liston. He was 22 years old. At that time, he was the youngest uh, heavyweight to ever win the title from the defending champ. He then, a year later, refought Liston and knocked him out in the first round, providing this picture, which is one of the most iconic in all of sports, right? Anybody ever seen that photo before? Everybody's seen that picture. I am the greatest. And you can hear Ali's voice just ringing out. He can't beat me, right, when he's talking about Joe Frazier. He can't beat me. He's too ugly to beat me. I, I'm too pretty. He couldn't beat me. He was the greatest boxer that ever lived. But I don't remember that. That's not my lasting image of Muhammad Ali. This is my lasting image of Muhammad Ali. If you can click one for me. Anybody remember this moment? 1996 Olympics. I was eight years old. And I remember going, this guy was the greatest athlete ever as he trembled trying to just control his hands to be able to light the torch. We grow old. Ben Folds is a singer-songwriter. He wrote a song about this very specific experience. It's called Boxing. You ready for it? It's a fictional conversation between Muhammad Ali and Howard Cosell, the, the announcer who gave all of the commentary during the boxing matches. Howard, the strangest things have happened lately when I take a good swing. At all of my dreams, they pivot and slip. I drop my fists in their back, laughing. Howard, my intentions become not to lose what I've won. Ambition has given way to desperation, and I have lost the fight from my eyes. Boxing's been good to me, Howard, but now I'm told you're growing old. The whole time you knew that in a couple of years I'd be through. Has boxing been good to you? Howard, I confess I'm scared and lonely and tired. They seem to think that I'm made of clay another day. And I'm not cut out for this. I just know what to say. I say, boxing's been good to me, Howard. Now I'm told you're growing old. The whole time you knew that a couple of years I'd be through. Has boxing been good to you? Sometimes I punch myself as hard as I can, yelling, nobody cares, hoping someone will tell me how wrong I am. 
Boxing's been good to me, Howard. But now I'm told you're growing old. The whole time you knew that a couple of years I'd be through. Has boxing been good to you? Even the greatest that ever was gets old. The self-proclaimed greatest to ever live could barely hold the torch. This is my lasting memory of Ali. How do you grow old well? What is it like to lose the abilities you once had? And where do you find comfort and stability and hope when you haven't just lost a step, you maybe have lost the ability to even step? You can't even walk anymore. I've watched two grandparents live and die within my parents' home. Watched people grow old. No fun growing old, right? Being trapped in a body and mind that won't perform the way that you want it to. It, it doesn't have the, the energy that you once did. Question for us this morning. How do you grow old in a dignified, God-honoring way? What does it look like for your hands to tremble and for God to be honored with your oldness, with your age, with, with your lack of ability that you once had? We are all mortal. Every time I do a funeral, I have a statistic that I throw out. If any of you have ever been there for a funeral that I've done, one of my favorite stats, one out of one people die. We all grow old. Every life ends right there at the casket. This morning in Genesis chapter 50, we are going to read a text about the death of Jacob. And at some level, it should remind us of our own mortality and give us an opportunity to grapple with the lessons from a saintly deathbed. If you have a Bible, we're going to start in chapter 49, verse 28. All these things are the twelve tribes of Israel. This is what their father had said to them as he blessed them, blessing each with a blessing suitable to him. Then he commanded them and said to them, I am to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron and the Hittite, in the cave that is in the field of Machpelah in the east of Mamre in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought with the field of Ephron the Hittite to possess a burying place. There they buried Abraham and Sarah, his wife. There they buried Isaac and Rebekah, his wife. And there I buried Leah. The field and the cave that is in it were bought from the Hittites. When Jacob finished commanding his sons, he drew up his feet into his bed and breathed, the last, breathed his last and was gathered to his people. Then Joseph fell on his father's face and wept over him and kissed him. And Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. So the physicians embalmed Israel. Forty days were required for it. Now that is how many were required for embalming. And the Egyptians wept for him for seventy days. Jump over to verse 12. Thus his sons did for him as he commanded them. His sons carried him to the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave of the field of Machpelah, the east of Mamre, which Abraham bought with the field of Ephron the Hittite, to possess a burying place. And after he had buried his father, Joseph returned to Egypt with his brothers and all who had gone up with him to bury his father. Word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, as we uh, approach the deathbed of Jacob, we ask that you would speak to us in our aging process that you would provide a clarity of our spirit, that your spirit would bring insight and, and that we would be able to read your word with clarity and understanding, and that our lives would be formed and molded into your character as a result. Lord, I ask for your hand of blessing upon me this morning as I preach your word. It is a humbling thing, Lord. I'm admittedly unworthy of it. 
just ask that you would help me to get out of the way of, of what is presented in your scripture. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. So this is the closing bit of Genesis. You have this little story of, of Jacob dying, and then you have a little episode between Joseph and his brothers, a reminder that you know, what we've looked at many, many times, and part of the reason why I chose not to focus on that, that, that you meant it for harm, but God meant it for good. If you've been here, you've heard that message several times. And then you see a similar scene with Joseph as he dies in the last few verses, and he tells his, his family, when you leave this place, carry my bones out and bury them in the promised land. I'd like for us to ponder this morning the, the struggle of growing old and dying. And we've been following the life of Jacob and his children for the last 25 chapters. He, by far, has the, the largest section of Genesis. It, and you could argue that we shifted to Joseph in chapter 37. It, it's all kind of under the umbrella of, of Jacob, though. As we've spent this expansive amount of time with the the last patriarch, we now get, as you saw two weeks ago, an extended deathbed scene. Uh, Charles Spurgeon, in a sermon on, on this text, which I'm actually going to read a quote from later, uh, but points out that this is a very unusual occurrence in Scripture. We actually don't have many deathbed scenes, which is an interesting observation. This is a unique thing. And so, with this rare occurrence we're going to ponder the least rare occurrence, death. Growing old it happens to everyone. And I have two very simple points this morning. The first one, life is suffering. As we sit at the deathbed of Jacob, an observer of his life for weeks that we've been studying Genesis. And the text points out to us that he, he drew up his feet and breathed his last in verse 33 of chapter 49. I can't help but be reminded of all the difficulty that those feet walked in their life and later on limped. He struggled through most of his existence hoping for an easing of the pain. If you remember his story, his struggles began in the womb. He was the, the wrestling deceiver from birth. On the run from his murderous brother, the home lover forced onto the road with a stone for a pillow and a dubious uncle tricking him into reaping the deceitful harvest that he sowed. He was the God wrestler he was the one who lost the beloved wife. He was the one who endured treachery of his children. The one who lost his beloved son. He had a life of pain. The life of suffering. And now we come to the end. A life that was anything but straightforward. This wasn't the path you would expect for God's chosen son from the chosen son from the chosen patriarch. It has now led him to the gate of heaven, a gate that he once glimpsed in the desert, with the ladder and the angels, of, the multitude of angels ascending and descending. But now he arrives by the conventional path through death. And even though he was that chosen son, he lived a very painful life. Now, this may, for some of you, feel like an entirely unnecessary point to make. You don't need to tell me that life is suffering. I know that. Plus, we've all seen Princess Bride, right? You, you know the line. Wesley speaking to Buttercup. Life is pain, Highness. Anybody who tells you different is selling you something. We, we take this as just self-evident. Life is a struggle. It is painful. However... There are many times, and if you've been here for a long time, you've probably heard me speak on this at some point before, that our Christian subculture likes to pretend like it isn't painful. 
We, we hang Thomas Kincaid paintings where everything just looks so nice and it's just idyllic and, and everybody's happy. Everybody's so happy. We have to put on that, that fake smile when you come to church, right? I've got to be okay. Everybody's okay here. We follow Jesus, so we're okay. Everything's good. Life is uplifting and encouraging. We, it's just everything's happy. And if we're not careful, we have a tendency to display Christianity as if it's some sort of spiritual country club. Everybody's got everything together. Aren't we glad that we all have it together? All the happy people are in here and all the hard stuff's out there and we just, we have everything together in this place. This country club Christianity is not biblical Christianity. The biblical text agrees with Princess Bride. It's just almost a, a, a self-evident truth that life is difficult. There's plenty of places. Isaiah 43, 2, When you pass through the waters, I will carry you. It's expected that you're going to go through difficulty. John 16, 33, In the world you will have tribulation. Galatians 6, 2, Carry each other's burdens. It's just implied there will be burdens. If you don't believe me, go and read Psalm uh, 39 or Psalm 88, the two psalms that, that are sorrowful and don't end with a note of hope. They are just heartbreaking. They end in darkness. There's no but the Lord will save me. It ends in frustration and hurt. It's almost blasphemous. It's a struggle. And that's just in the more generic sense that... There is a much more specific Christian sense of suffering. If you have your Bible, I, I, I could go lots of places, but 1 Peter has several of them. You should turn there with me. We'll look at three different places where this is very clear in the biblical text. If you're using a Bible from the chairs, page uh, 1014. Life is difficult. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, In this you rejoice, though you now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Various trials that come to your life. You can just turn over to the next page, chapter 2, verses 19 and 21. For this is a gracious thing, when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it, if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure? This is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you may follow in His steps. One more, turn over, chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when His glory is revealed. A life of following God is a painful one. You don't have to try and cover up the difficulty of your Christian life. Now that, that doesn't mean that there isn't hope that outlasts that difficulty. There absolutely is. But there is a time to weep. If you noticed in our text today, they cry for 70 days for Jacob. You don't have to pretend like the Christian life is all joyous and exciting and happy all the time. There are moments where it is suffering and lament. And as a follower of Christ, you need to allow that reality to be seen to other believers, to non-believers, and honestly to yourself. Don't try to lie to you. 
This is hard. Christianity is not an escapism. Jacob struggled through his life of trying to follow God. It was painful. And not the, the physical pain that I'm talking about of being sore from playing football because I'm too old to do it. I'm talking about deep relational hurt. Wounds that, that take decades to heal, not weekends. Christianity is not attempting to sell you something. There is pain here. In this world, you will have trouble this isn't peace, it's the sword. If the world hates you, take care. It hated me first. If the biblical message is a salesman, it's doing a terrible job. It's zooming in on the fine print that they don't want you to read. Slowing down at the end of the commercial where all of the side effects are listed and that auctioneer voice comes out and they just... It's, it's slowing down and making you focus. This is going to be difficult. As Christ calls it in the book of Luke, you need to count the cost. Because it will be costly to follow Him. However, the pain is always there. But, point number two, following God makes the pain meaningful. Pain is an inevitable part of being human. There's no way to escape from it. You can insulate yourself as best as you possibly can. Pain is going to find its way to your doorstep at some point. However, if you want to thrive in the pain, to grow old in a dignified, godly way, how are you to do that? You follow God. Where do I get this from Jacob's life? Well, what are his thoughts? What are his last words we have in his closing deathbed? Don't let me die here. When I die, you need to take my body out from this place and bury me in the promised land. Now, the promised land for Jacob is more than just a piece of ground. The land is indicative of relationship. When you are in the land, you are in right relationship with God. When you are out of the land, you are in some ways separated from God. You can see this in the Exodus story. We're going to look at the Exodus briefly next week and its relationship to Advent, which is a curious connection, but a more powerful one than I would have guessed. But in the Exodus, when, when Moses goes to Pharaoh and he tells them to let his people go, there's a reason attached so that they may go and worship me in the wilderness. The land is meant for relationship. Jacob is not just asking him, his descendants to bury him in the land of his fathers just so that he can be close to their gravestones. He's trying to be close to his God. He is following in obedience. This is what God has called them to. For us on the other side of the cross, it's a reminder. We see Jacob's life and as he, he draws up his feet and breathes his last, his, his dying thoughts are, I want to be close to God. When you find yourself on the edge of that deathbed, It's a reminder for us that those who are in Christ do not die in the ongoing, meaningless, frustrating battle against suffering. We die as, as Jacob did at his deathbed, reminded that we are covered by the blood of Christ. That we have been brought close to Him. And that the relationship that has sustained us through the pain will sustain us through death. We don't die in the fruitless struggle against suffering. We enter through the gates of splendor finding great value in our toil. You're in 1 Peter still, are you not? 
you jump down, what is the conclusion in this section on suffering? Verse 19. Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful Creator while doing good. What is the biblical prescription for the life of pain? Entrust your soul to the caring God. Follow Him fully. Chase after His desires through your pain. You don't want to arrive at the waiting deathbed, the conclusion of the growing old process, bemoaning the fact that you have followed after useless goals in your life. In your difficulty, entrust your soul to God. Follow after Him. Do not enter into the presence of God frustrated with your own lack of effort for having followed Him in your life. If you are a believer, you follow Him fully. That is the call through pain. To know that you have something that that endures beyond the pain beyond the suffering. And if you are here today and you are not a follower of Christ, I'm so grateful that you came. It is a distinct joy and privilege for me to proclaim the message to you that there is meaning to your hardship. That there is value to the difficulty of life. That that you don't have to just toil and be frustrated but that you can place your trust in Christ and be washed by His blood and give purpose to the difficulty. Arrive at the deathbed having lived a life of following after Him. To me, it it has all kinds of connotations of of hard work. You ever feel the soreness after a day of work. There's there's beauty in that pain, is there not? There's something redemptive in that. That I didn't just work, I'm not just in pain just for pain's sake. That pain produced something valuable. There There was great purpose in my toil and frustration. That's the Christian life. It is the hard work that is is painful that yields great value. It is worth it. It is worth it to follow Him through through the pain, to entrust your soul to the faithful Creator, even while suffering. We are to entrust ourselves to Him. To follow Him fully. It gives great purpose to our pain. I saw a post online this week. Online is always a treacherous place. I don't know if I like it or not, but it's just part of the world in which I live. I can't do anything about it. Maybe I could. I don't know. Maybe I could just not use computers. I'd be all right with that some days. Anyhow, somebody was posting something. It was a a, a Christian feel-good type of message. And they had all these promises from God. And I didn't even get past the first one. I don't even know what the rest of them were because I couldn't get over the hurdle of the first one. And it said that Galatians 2.20 tells me that I am not defined by my past. If you know Galatians 2.20, let me read it out for you. It's a famous verse. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. I have been dragged against my will by nature of birth directly into the center of the millennial generation. It's just a crime of when I was born. I can't do anything about it. So I stand here today unwillingly a part of this, to say, you need to read your Bibles better, millennials. (laughs) That is a terrible way to read Galatians 2. To say that Galatians 2 means I'm not defined by my past. That is what I would call the department store dressing room hermeneutic of Scripture. 
everywhere you look, there's a mirror that points to you. Oh, look, me. It's just me everywhere I go. Everywhere I turn. Galatians 2 doesn't mean you're not defined by your past. It means that you are defined by Christ. It's not just that you aren't what you used to be. It's that you are now Him. You are, you are in Christ and you are something new. To just take the first half of it, that I'm not defined by my past anymore, is just fluffy millennial nonsense. You have to supplement that with the truth that you are now identified by Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. You want to have meaning and value to your pain? Define your life by following Christ. You want to die well? Arrive at the end of the aging process? Define your life by following Christ. John Newton, the author of the great hymn, Amazing Grace. I've told you this story before, but it bears repeating. His dying words, I've forgotten many things in this life, but two things I remember. I am a great sinner, and Jesus is a greater Savior. That's the type of life-defining identity in Christ that will lead you to, to walk through pain in a God-honoring way. To, to walk through aging and, and even the deathbed in a God-honoring way. If you live for Christ, then you will die for Him. Is there that much difference between the two? As a pastor, I want to equip, enable, and encourage you and me to glorify God with your life. And one of the primary elements of that task is preparing us to walk through suffering. To walk through suffering with you. To model for you how to walk through suffering in a godly way. And the biblical prescription is clear. Following God brings meaning to your pain. It is the, the soreness after a long day of work that produces something of value. We all suffer. Life is pain. Live for God. Live for the eternal things that extend beyond this painful life. Live for value that extends beyond your net worth. Live to be defined by Christ. I told you I would read a little passage from a sermon Charles Spurgeon gave on this passage. This is what he says. It is remarkable that the Holy Spirit has given us very few deathbed scenes in the book of God. We have very few in the Old Testament and fewer still in the New. And I take it that the reason may be because the Holy Spirit would have us take more account of how we live than how we die. For life is the main business. He who learns to die daily while he lives will find it no difficulty to breathe out his soul for the last time into the hands of his faithful creator. If we fight the battle well, we may rest assured of the victory. If enlisted under the banner of truth, resting in Jesus Christ, we finish our fight and keep the faith. We need not fear, but that our entering into rest will be a blessed one. To be a dignified, God-honoring, growing, old, dying Christian is to find in death a mere continuation of what is pursued in life. Entering into deeper communion with God. we we'll close with the words of Paul in 2 Corinthians. You don't need to turn there, just listen to it. The Bible was written to be heard. Hear the words. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. 
Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Let's pray. Lord, we ask for your help in guiding us through growing old and through dying to keep our eyes fixed on the eternal things, even in the midst of the great suffering that is this life. We fall on you, Lord. We need you to guide us through that. We cannot do it on our own. We ask for this truth, that, that our value uh, of chasing after you brings meaning to our pain, to guide our lives to be an ever-present sense of hope in the midst of struggle, pain, loss, and suffering. We're so thankful to be adopted to be your sons and daughters, Lord. We do not deserve it. And yet here we stand covered by your grace, preparing for the weight of glory. Thank you. In your name we pray. Amen.